So there is no any kind of synchronization between the audio and the video. It's just to show a little bit the, the tactility of the sound and how I will integrate it in the, in the project. Uh, so yeah, this is a way to represent um, this kind of sensation which is not visual and is not easy then to, to show it. What we see right here, it's um, uh, very high frequencies beyond our hearing uh, uh, ability and ultrasound frequencies and we are able to see them through the dry eyes here effect so if you want to hear the whole piece you can visit my website um, so i will start maybe with this real versus surreal we spoke a lot about reality so another version of it um, also probably there's just one reality the real reality um, so what we see here it's the flower left uh, this one which you can say it's so well done which looks like unreal okay and then there's another one that has certain um, also details and things and you can say oh this unreal thing it's so well done too which looks like real so we use a reversed way for the same thing so something which is very well done we can say we can call it this not real and something which is very naturally very uh, <coughs> kind of detailed we can say oh it looks like fake unreal so to to be clear this is real and this is not real it's plastic this one okay so why i say that because actually when we work with sound uh, on a, working on a piece, we try to create again to to uh, integrate into our piece um, non-real elements, and we try to give them some sort of life. Okay, uh, for example, if you work on a soundscape piece or you have soundscape elements in the piece, you have a wind. I will give you an example of this. You want to make it as natural as possible. Or if it's not natural, the wind you will use. So how can we do that? So for this piece, I used um, kind of uh, non-standard techniques to do that. So there is a game engine called WWISE, which has this called procedural uh, audio. It has certain tools to create virtual environments in real time, which sounds like real. OK, so in the piece, I have a whole section which involves uh, wind sounds. So instead of just going out and recording sounds, I can make them here as precise as I want and uh, render them. So I'll just give you a little example of it. I tried this time to open up very many different applications at once. Let's see if that will work. I'll delete the tool and I'll just add it again. All right. Maybe, do you see it right there? It's there.
Um, I'd rather just see how this system works. So this is a, an engine mostly for video games, but apparently you can use it for audio um, editing too. It's very powerful and has certain advantages against the <coughs> classic, let's say, tools we use. So let me try on some more. So here we have now the, the, um, the stereo image or the quadraphonic, depending what we want to do. And here we have one sound source, which is a wind. We can place it wherever we want. So I'll just play. I can move it around left or right, back or forth. I can change the pitch. Okay. I can change the Q factor with some sort of filter. some of them, which makes it rather fixed. So now the whole thing loops every 10 seconds. I can adjust that from here. OK, just here at the, the peak. Um, or I can make it an hour or as long as I want. So I can create certain uh, uh, variations and repeat them every time I, uh, I want or just improvise and create exactly the sound, the, the wind I want, the, the wind I think is appropriate for the moment, the piece I'm working. So this is one of the things I did use, uh, and I was pretty happy. And of course, there are other simulators. You can uh, also simulate water, apparently footsteps, because they're very useful for video gaming, not for a musical piece, probably. Also, I do use, I, I do have footsteps in this piece. Uh, but. Uh, and uh, there are for cars, simulators, and other uh, kind of useful for video gaming uh, engines. And uh, apparently, uh, I believe uh, that sooner or later we'll have more of them available. The goal is to have as many as possible, if, at all, uh, if possible, all of them um, generate all of the sounds generated like that, because that makes it more real and actually much more efficient than uh, cheap for the CPU power. Uh, another thing I did is uh, this kind of audio, bra audio browsing techniques, uh, which is within the music information retrieval uh, zone. Uh, when we work with uh, electroacoustic sound compositions, we use hundreds, maybe thousands of sounds. And often the problem is how can we control them, how can we find them? First, you have a huge database of sounds. How can we select them and things like that? So using techniques uh, like audio browsing could be very beneficial. So I will show you here an app that I have used called SoundTorch. Um, and what you do here, you just um, set a folder and the software will analyze all the sounds one by one and will create a map and we'll place them in terms of similarity. So this sound down here is kind of less similar with those up there. So I can just go close and play it. You hear this very soft sound. The closer to the center, the more focused with the sound. OK, 
Okay. So what, what besides that, now I get some sort of scale now of, of my sound, which one is closer to the other and how can I combine them? So the closer the sounds, the, the better the fusion between them. So if you want to create a really coherent sound image, probably you will pick sounds which are around the same area and that will perceptually fuse very well. Um, and another uh, advantage of using these techniques is I can also uh, make the torch bigger or smaller. So slowly I can embrace all of them and sort of create a soundscape, real time interactive soundscape and try things. I can also move sounds uh, or mute sounds and try to see how my soundscape balances like this way or the other way. And once I'm set, I can just export the sound file. So I can take off some of them. Okay. So you can move to other materials and things like that. So this is quite effective and interesting way also to work with. Um, so that's more in terms of sound editing and manipulation. Now the other facet of this project was to develop uh, the ultra and infrasound uh, techniques, which I will explain to you right away. So first, let's picture, the, picture this. When we play an instrument, I will give you an example of the, the, the violin, we hold it like that and we touch the violin with our chin, uh, with our chest here, with our fingers, and the, the, the instrument, of course, while you play, it vibrates, okay, vibrates the, the body of the instrument, vibrates the strings, uh, the, the bow on the strings, everything. And of course, since we are uh, holding it, these vibrations move to our body too, and we feel them, but not you, only me, the performer. And that's some sort of gap we have when we listen to music, we don't have exactly the same experience as the performer because we don't feel the sound, he feels the sound besides hearing the sound. And that's quite a lot of information actually. If we were trying to um, record the data, it's pretty much half of the data we could get out of it. Uh, so normally the audience will get just the sound. Okay, uh, so this project is trying a little bit to bridge this gap and bring this experience to the audience too. So how can we do that? How can we add the tactility of the sound into the listening experience? So I call that a kind of holistic listening experience. And there are five known pathways to perceive sound. One is through our cochlea via uh, bone conduction. And um, when we play the violin, we definitely take advantage of it because we have here the instrument and we get the vibration right away to our cochlea. Uh, through our, uh, the skin via tactile sound perception, again, when you play an instrument, your, your skin is almost always, always involved, uh, more or less. Uh, through the deep tissue uh, via uh, movement, um, this is not probably always the case. Um, but in many instruments, we get that. Um, of course, it will be more uh, effective if we have explosions and big sounds. Uh, through the skeletal joints via movement, also very uh, obvious and common uh, way to, to feel the sound. And throughout the ears, which is the standard way. So as you see, there are four more than the, the way we normally uh, perceive sound four more ways, four more pathways, altogether five. Each of them is more effective in different ranges of frequencies and different um, uh, even temperatures. Here there's an interesting uh, picture which shows uh, which parts of our body are more sensitive. And that's quite an interesting thing, to, uh, thing too. You see our hands are extremely sensitive. Our uh, the tactile perception on our fingertips, of course, and in general, our palms are very sensitive. Other parts of our body are not at all. Um, so that was one of the things I had to think. So how can I 
of course, give a lot of information uh, and what kind of information I will give in my palms. So for, for the, the palms, I, I decided to use the infrasound part of the, of the sound, of the, of the sound of the piece. Um, so I had to develop my own sort of speaker. Um, there's no really a commercial thing to, to get this. Uh, there are a few commercial um, uh, products, but they're not uh, made for this purpose. Um, uh, so I had to develop this, and <coughs> I did use um, uh, ultrasonic transducers, um, in this case, about 100. The more you have, the, the stronger the signal, the sensation will be at the peak of uh, the, the speaker, so to say. And, um, uh, and the, the, the existing one uh, are mostly for um, um, one of them, which is developed in, in Slovenia. They use it in order to, as a controller, because in a way you send something and then you, um, you can control it. And in video games in general, again, you, you feel the ball, let's say, as you are going to, to play with the ball in, inside the game. Uh, both of them are very experimental, as it is in here, too. Um, so I had to develop this um, little speaker that uh, creates this field, and then you feel the sound waves on your hands. And that's what we saw with the video towards the end with the dry eyes. So you could see the sound waves in the same way you feel them. The sensation is not very strong again, but it's strong enough to feel it. Um, and here, this is what you see. This is from the Perot Museum. Uh, while I did install the, the whole thing and I demonstrated to people, more than 100 people uh, tried it. They were very excited, actually, about it. Um, so there is a chair besides that thing. Actually, the ultrasound uh, is here. Okay, so it's, uh, let's say, this is a prototype, of course. It's on the left and right side of your, of your, of you while you're sitting. Um, <coughs> you are surrounded by five point on surround. And you have different types of transducers that will also send you different types of frequencies. So I use the, the uh, other transducers to uh, translate low frequencies, okay, from 0 0.1 to about 500 hertz. Um, and some of them, of course, will be audible too, because if you play, if you use them for this kind of frequency, like 500 hertz, it's definitely audible. However, you can limit them up to 20 frequency, 20 hertz, which is not audible. But since we, now we have transducers who can do that effectively up to almost 2,000 hertz, it's, it's not a bad idea. Uh, so here, what you see, first of all, this uh, cochlear uh, headphone. So you place it just like that, like normal headphones, actually, but they don't go to your uh, ear tubes, but behind your ears. And then it goes directly to your cochlear, uh, from your uh, scalp to the cochlear, and then you hear them internally. So what you hear is, uh, through them is just the normal audio, but not only from the normal way, but also from inside somehow, for, through your bones. Um, so it's the same exactly piece of music coming through that. What you hear from the ultrasound transducers, it's something else. It's another uh, layer of music that you don't hear, you just sense it, okay? And I had to compose that and create some sort of counterpoint between the, uh, what we hear and what we sense uh, on our hands. And then the rest of them uh, will create uh, vibrations and will translate very low frequencies uh, and we'll feel them again through our body. So these are the main channels. Um, so all of uh, the transducers are designed and um, adjusted in a way to make you feel all these different five paths of uh, perception, of sound perception. So they play the right frequencies and the right uh, uh, places. Um, I'll just move down here. And this is the project where I composed the piece. It's just a Cubase. You may be familiar with that project. And here I have the audible part of it, surround 5.1, left, right, rear, 
low frequencies and stuff. <coughs> and then the cochlear, which is, as I said, a reduction of the 5.01. It's exactly the same thing, but just a reduction to a stereo version. And then we have the ultrasound one and two, which I had to compose. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the transducers for the infrasound. Um, one of my goals w was to use audio to control all of them, because you can also use just data, let's say, um, since you're, we are talking about very low frequencies or very high frequencies, and they're not, did not really make sense in terms of um, sound. But uh, I tried to do that and to manipulate it with the standard tools we have. Nowadays, with our computers and our audio interface, we can work with uh, very high frequencies and frequency resolutions, and therefore we can work with infrasounds and ultrasounds without the need to use very expensive um, converters or stuff like that. Just a, a decent pro card can do that with pro and audio interface. Um, so uh, that, that was a way to work uh, during the composition process. So I had an immediate feedback. Okay, I, I want here to have a low frequency. I can feel it right away. It's not like, okay, I imagine it because it really matters. And as you work with this uh, way, you, you understand all these little differences, how they, they change your perception for the audible part too. So one of the compositional tools I have developed, which I'm not gonna talk really today here um, in detail, is let's say you can have um, a low uh, stimuli like a pulse on your body, which goes together with an element in the audible part. And then if you feel that, you will also hear it. If you don't feel it, you may not hear it because your attention will go somewhere else because this is not very apparent in the sound texture, let's say. So this way you can control also the focus and the attention of the listener, what to hear when somehow. Or you can create some sort of counterpoint, which was uh, one of the main tools. So something else you feel, something else you hear. Normally in the film industry, you will hear what you feel. So you did a boom and you will, the chair will shake, okay? Uh, so there's no need to really create some sort of counterpoint or to, to compose something for the uh, tactile part of it. But in this case, of course, there were three basic channels that I had to compose. And I can demonstrate that a little bit here, uh, which is a simple patch I have developed to, to do that, uh, which I'll show you right now. So here we just see the ultrasound uh, range, 22 kilohertz to 40 kilohertz. Of course, could go more than that. Uh, 20 to 22 kilohertz, which is the audible part, and then the infrasound. Okay, and we don't. We're not going to hear the top and the bottom, just the audible part, apparently, because we just use the normal speakers here. Uh, but you will see the rest of them. So I'll just replay a little bit of what you heard before. So in the very first burst, you feel something on your palms. As you see, there is a purple image. And you've also, there is a rumble. You also hear something going on. And here there was some sort of pulse. so on. So that gives us, give us a little bit of an idea of, uh, represents a little bit the sound, what happens above and below our um, hearing uh, ranges. Uh, so that's uh, the main, these are the main parts of the project. So again, um, the goal was to create some sort of um, listening perception which I call here holophonic listening perception uh, or listening experience, uh, where you hear and you feel uh, at the same time the sound. And to, to, to bridge a little bit the gap between what the performer will hear and what uh, uh, a listener will hear. So kind of um, extensions of this project would be uh, just a hall with 
chairs like that, let's say, of course mapped and connected in a way that will not just amplify the, the audible part, but it will play independently. Um, so to have, to feel more like the performer feels uh, while he performs or she performs. Uh, of course, you can use that for video games. I, uh, there are, I guess, quite a few implementations already. Uh, my focus was mostly to develop actually compositional techniques for that, okay? Um, I didn't use any new technology besides the ultrasound uh, uh, speaker, which is, uh, which exists, but it's not really in a commercial uh, version uh, so far. Uh, they're all existing. Uh, technologies and you can just purchase them and make it if you want um, to do something like that. So that's it. Do we have any questions or comments? Thank you.